Ireland is here again with the age-old question, will it rain? The thing of guts, those shots and volleys. Interspersed by coloured brollies, the loyal British tennis fan patiently waits to cheer his man. Across the world the players come for one brief fortnight in the sun. Muscles flash, emotions fraught, the magic of the centre court. Champagne, strawberries, the ticket tout. This is what Wimbledon's all about. Those ancient ivy-covered walls look down upon those close line calls. Serves to break the speed of sound, thunder chalk up from the ground. Ball girls run, the linesmen shout. The umpire judges in or out. In the end, when all's said and done, the world shall see who's number one. On last year's turf, he reached his peak. Now everyone knows of Michael Stieck. In front of royalty, she played her best. A fourth title is now her quest. For one fortnight, these courts await for anxious fans and tennis greats. The tradition of Wimbledon, oh so rare. The next two weeks we all shall share. So up with the curtain, let the show begin. The All England Championships are here again. After 50 weeks of waiting, 50 weeks of reminiscing about last year's rain-drenched tournament, when unprecedented play on the middle Sunday brought onto the grounds of the All England Club thousands of fans who might never otherwise have seen a Wimbledon match, the Lawn Tennis Championships return for the 106th time to this sprawling, unique complex of grass courts southwest of London. The London Metropolitan Weather Office tells us, although rather cloudy at times, some good sunny spells are expected for day one. Temperatures now at 69 degrees, humidity 56 percent, partly sunny, though a few small showers would be in no way unexpected, certainly not for those of us who slogged through the fortnight a year ago. Hello again, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome back to an HBO tradition, our fortnight at Wimbledon. With me is 1975 men's singles champion Arthur Ashe and Arthur, what a unique situation we have this year in the seedings. Jim Courier and Monica Seles have both been so dominant in the sport for the past several months that you really couldn't question the idea of seeding them number one. Yet I know that you and various other people don't favor either of them to win the tournament. Well, I don't. Not on grass. But this is almost like a force majeure situation. Their records are so good the past six months, having won the Australian and the French. What else can you do with them? You've got to put them at number one. And just to underline the point, isn't this the only major tournament in the world where neither Courier nor Celis would be an overwhelming favorite to win? Yes, yeah, certainly. On any other surface, indoors, cement, or clay, they certainly would be number one. Arthur, let's take a look at the uh, 16 seeded players on the men's side, and you run down the top five of them for us. Well, Courier at the top of the list, number one. Uh, the committee thinks he should be there, and that's okay with me. I don't think he's a favorite. But let's now pop down to the very bottom. Stefan Edberg at number two. He is my personal favorite. In addition, he lives here in London, so he can sleep and eat at home. And Michael Steech, last year's champion, even though he is number four on the ATP rankings, they bumped him up because, well, he won this tournament last year. Boris Becker, an enigma to me. I don't really think he feels like playing right now, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he lost before the quarterfinals. And Pete Sampras, the U.S. Open champion two years ago, there's no pressure on him, so he might sneak through the draw without causing too much of a fuss. And while the tournament committee adheres to the rankings in seeding Courier and Celis number one, they move Sampras down from number three to number five. Why? Well, I get the feeling they didn't want to stack previous Wimbledon champions all in one section. And in order to even out the draw a little bit, they did a little rearranging. And I guess there's some method there, my madness. 
Sampras, the Californian who many believe is going to win the tournament some year, perhaps this year, will be under our vision today on court number 14. His opponent, a relatively tough first-round opponent, Andrei Cherkasov of Russia. Sampras has won two of their three preceding matches. Over on court two, legendary here as the upset court, it will be Stefan Edberg, twice a champion here in the past five years, taking on Steve Bryan of the United States, a former NCAA titleist who has never played at Wimbledon before. On court number one, you have the number one seated man, and he has won half of a grand slam for the year as he comes here. Champion at Australia and France, Jim Courier, taking on Marcus Zirka of Germany on court number one. They've never played before. Following that on court number one, Monica Sellis, the top seated woman, taking on Jenny Byrne. And just as was the case with Courier and Zirka, these two players have never met before. And then Jimmy Connors of the United States, with another renewal of his efforts at Wimbledon, and his first meeting ever with Luis Herrera, a Mexican Davis Cupper who is given a chance of upsetting Connors today. And finally, over on center court, you have the defending champion in the tournament, Michael Stich of Germany, taking on Stefano Pescosolido of Italy, ranked 46th in the world, and a relatively tough opening round opponent for Stich. Arthur, how has Michael Stich's life been changed in the past year after his surprise win at Wimbledon? Well, it certainly has changed a lot, Jim, I think. First of all, because he is now the third very good player from Germany. And secondly, I think it's because he has to differentiate himself from Boris Becker, who is the second most well-known name in all of Germany. All right, here are some of the biographical details. He's 23 years old, 6 feet 4 inches tall, from Elmshorn, Germany. Of the five tournaments won, of course, one of them, last year's Wimbledon Championship. And what a remarkable accomplishment, Arthur. Yes, you look at his last three matches on his way to winning the... So what a threesome. That's quite a threesome. Today is Stefano Pescosolido of Italy, as I mentioned, ranked 46th in the world, 21 years old, 6 feet 1 inches tall. Probably doesn't have the style of game to give Stich a lot of trouble here on grass, but nevertheless, that 46th ranking is formidable when you look at the path he has taken coming from 739th in 1988. So now, let's go to center court to pick up the action. Michael Stis, the defending champion against Stefano Pescosolido of Italy. Seed Brad Gilbert, now living in San Rafael, California, going, going against Jean-Philippe Florian from Paris, France. Gilbert playing extremely well out here. Won the first set 6-2, leads 5-3. Gilbert with the dark specs, Billy, and this is set point for Gilbert to go up two sets to low. Well, Florian's just been going for too much, Barry, especially against someone like Brad Gilbert, doesn't overpower you. Florian's been taking all the risk. He goes for the lines too much. He certainly has been going for shots, and now he is in trouble. Gilbert with a chance to go up two sets to love out here on court number three. Those players stay in the backcourt. That ball is long. And there it is, Brad Gilbert with a two-set to love lead on court number three. Now, let's head out for court number two, where the Russian, Volkov, is going against Emilio Sanchez. Alexander Volkov, seated number 15, going against the Spaniard, Emilio Sanchez, court number two. Fifteen forty. Well, Volkov is a wonderful grass court player, Barry. Yes, He's left-handed, hits the ball severely, and he feels comfortable at net, which uh, a lot of players don't anymore. Double set point. As you can see the scoreboard there, two sets to love for Volkov. Ah! Second serve for the Russian from Kaliningrad, Russia, 25 years old. Seated number 15. Okay. And a double fall. And there it is. Two sets to one. Back to you, Jim. After last year's rain-drenched first week that threw the tournament schedule into the proverbial cocked hat, it's been steady as she goes here on this first day of all singles play. That picture of Big Ben taped at, oh, I'd say, five minutes to ten this morning. And let's take a look around the grounds now at some of the scores from significant matches taking place today. Todd Woodbridge of Australia, a good doubles player who sometimes makes a dent on grass, got a straight set win over Fernando Roesi of Brazil. 
Simon Yule of Australia move forward as Richard Fromberg, down two sets, retired in the third set with a shoulder injury. Nicholas Colty made a name for himself at the French Open. The young Swede had victories over McEnroe and Chang before losing to Lacan at the French. Today he won in one hour and four minutes. Is it close to a record for shortest match? Nah. There was a straight set final here in 37 minutes, only 111 years ago. A straight set victory today for Magnus Larsson of Sweden over Javier Frana of Argentina. And another Swede, perennial qualifier Henrik Holm, got a victory over Grant Doyle of Argentina in four sets to join his countrymen in moving forward. Most of the big name players have been playing on the show courts, center court and court number one. But there are lots of significant matches on the outer courts as well. Here are Barry and Billie Jean. All right, Jim, Billie Jean and I have got two fine matches on these outer courts today, along with a lot of other good action out here. On court number two, the two-time Wimbledon champion, Stefan Edberg, going against a former national intercollegiate champion from the University of Texas, Steve Bryant. Stefan Edberg, a classic player, Billy. What makes him such a good grass court player? Well, he's tall. He's six feet two. He has great mobility. He just glides around the court. But what I love about him is his balance at net. It's impeccable. Edberg will be going for his third Wimbledon title this year. And then on court 14, Pete Sampras, seated number five. A lot of people think this could be Pete's year. Going against the Russian, Andrei Cherkasov. Cherkasov, very tough. He has wins over both Courier and Boris Becker. Now, Sampras is tough, but does he play the big points well, Billy? Not yet. He really needs to learn to raise his game a level. He, he's not very aggressive on those points. Whereas Jim Courier, on the other hand, boy, wins the big points. He says, give me the ball. Sampras is going to have a chance to play big points for two weeks out here if he wins today. Those are two of the matches we'll be covering. We have a lot of other excellent action on these outer courts. Back to you, Jim. All right, we'll be going back to Billie Jean and Barry for more a little bit later on. But by far, the biggest story in the men's draw this year is American Jim Courier, who is the first since Mats Wielander in 1988 to arrive here having won the first two legs of the Grand Slam. We're going to take our first look at Courier today as we go out to court number one to pick up the top seated man in the tournament. On court number one, Jim Stolle, son of the great Fred Stolle, one of the hardest servers on the circuit. He moves forward after Czechoslovakia's Karol Novacek retires in the second set with a thigh injury. As does Mark Petchy of England, the four set winner over Dave Randall of the United States, and that gets the English very excited. Mark Woodford of Australia, good grass court player, was expected to have a close match with Jan Simmerink of Holland, but won it in four sets, and he goes forward, as does Stafford of South Africa, a winner over Tomas Muster of Austria, surprisingly easily, in three sets. And Carlos Costa of Spain is the 10th-ranked player in the world. Might have been seeded here, but the tournament committee dropped him out of the seedings because they see him only as a clay court specialist. Today, he's got a grass court win in five sets over Carl Lindberger of Australia, no less. Now, you know you're going to be seeing Wimbledon every night at 5 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time here on HBO this week. Wednesday, we will give you a double dose of major sports, as that evening at 9 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time, we'll premiere our delayed coverage of the heavyweight championship fight between Evander Holyfield and Larry Holmes, in which the 42-year-old Holmes extended Holyfield to the full 12-round limit before dropping a unanimous decision. You'll see it for the first time. 9 o'clock Eastern and Pacific Time, Wednesday night. And, of course, the Larry Holmes of these Wimbledon tennis championships is 39-year-old Jimmy Connors, playing in his 102nd singles match at Wimbledon here today against Luis Herrera of Mexico. Connors is 184, lost 17 in singles. He won the tournament in 1974 and again in 1982 on another trip to the finals. He was beaten in 1975 by Arthur Ashe, who joins me now to talk about Jimmy Connors in September. And today, as he begins his 20th Wimbledon journey, he'll be playing his 102nd singles match here against Luis Herrera of Mexico. We'll have that for you later. Courier on the crossover. Godfrey became the first ever woman vice president in the history of the All England Lawn Tennis Club. This past Friday, Kitty Godfrey, aged 96, passed away. And with her went an important piece of Wimbledon history. This is the way Kitty Godfrey looked a few years back at a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the women's competition. She won the championship in 1924 and 1926. At this time, she was in her early 90s. 
and when she won back in 1924, she accomplished a signal feat, becoming the only woman ever to score a singles victory here over the late, great Helen Wills. Well, someone who would love to duplicate the accomplishments of Helen Wills is Monica Sellis, who's won every other Grand Slam tournament, but has not yet won this one. An important political distinction from Sellis over the course of the weekend. Having stipulated for the past few years that her residence was Sarasota, Florida, Sellis has now decided to go back to her Yugoslavian de designation. She becomes once again Monica Sellis of Yugoslavia, but she has told reporters here that if anyone at a post-match press conference asks her a question about why she now wants to be seen as being from Yugoslavia, she'll do what Steffi Graf promised to do two years ago when asked questions about her father's affair with a penthouse pet get up and walk out of the press conference. Well, whatever Sellis does is bound to cause notice and sometimes controversy. And for more on that, we go out to the grounds to check in with ace reporter Larry Merchant. At 18, Monica Sellis has won six major championships and been involved in almost as many controversies, or what passes as controversy in the hermetic world of tennis. Last year, after winning the Australian and French Opens, Sellis pulled out of Wimbledon, pulled out as the top seed just four days before the tournament began. She had leg injuries, but she made a mystery of them by simply not saying so. One theory was that she was using her well-developed sense of drama to exploit Wimbledon. Another theory, advanced by the local tabloids, she was pregnant. Already this year, she has been swirled in another controversy whether she should be identified with her native and very troubled Yugoslavia or with her adopted America. Meanwhile, she has admitted to the injuries of last year, shin splints and a stress fracture. Perhaps Wimbledon is repaying that sense of drama this year by burying her first round appearance amid the men's top seeds. Jim? Well, despite the glamour of the men who are playing on center court and court number one, it's awfully hard to bury Sellis She's won the last five Grand Slam tournaments she has entered, the last six Grand Slam finals in which she's appeared. And she launches her Wimbledon journey for 1992 today on court number one. We go take a look at the match right now. Monica Sellis in control over here on court one. The number one seed has won the first set, 6-2. This is a first round ladies singles match. Monica Sellis leading 3-1 in the second set with the first already tucked away. Oh, yes, that is as solid two-handed as you can get. How about the grunt, Billy? Do you think it bothers the other lady players? It does bother some of them, but she's not going to stop grunting. She better, <laughs> better get used to it. Better huh? get used to it and focus. shot maybe a little bit short that is Monica coming in quickly you know what else she does very well Billy is get down to the ball with her height these balls are staying low on this slick grass surface no call service ace you can see the lines person at the top of your screen there who moved over gave it the safe signal so sell us up 40 love It's going to go wide, and so Monica Sellis holds. She leads 4-1. Let's head out now to court number two, where Steve Bryan is going against Stefan Edberg. Let's head back to court number one. Monica Sellis going against Jenny Byrne. Sellis up a set, and 4-1 in the second. Has it under control over here on court one. Yes. That's the kind of shot you get to play against Monica. Try and get her off court. This is a good play. If you can make Monica have to go to that one-handed forehand, cover that line like crazy. 
Billy, it's rare that you see her hit that one-hander. She's really stretched out when she hits it. Yes, and she doesn't like it. I mean, it's all relative. She still hits some great shots off that one-handed forehand. Again, we saw the one-hander. Very unusual. Looked like she got a low bounce on that ball. It was a great get by uh, Jenny Byrne on the volley. Ooh. So Jenny Byrne now trying to stay in this match. Up 30, love, but down 1-4. Interesting to me how far inside that baseline Monica is sneaking on the second serve. Look at her there. Well inside the baseline. And we mentioned that's where the court helps you because it slants out to the right there. Burn at 40 low. Jenny Byrne hanging in out here on court one, hold serve, 4-2, Ellis leading in the second set, she has the first, and this a crucial game, Billy, many people think that seventh game of any set, a big turning point, if Byrne could somehow break here, she'd be right back in this set. Well, Byrne looks focused. Definitely. Looks as if she thinks she is in this match, that's what's necessary. Just gets the table. We saw Sellis swing under that two-hander. Good variety, doesn't she, from the baseline? She can slice the ball. She can come over it. Absolutely. And she instinctively knows what the correct shot is. Goodbye. Yeah, they use the expression, using all of the court. Monica seems just to have a, a knack, an instinct to hit those tremendous angles to get her opponent on the run. Thirty fifteen. Thirty fifteen. Ladies and gentlemen, no flashlight photography, thank you. Yes, right in the corner. Sellis with game point. Second serve now. Oh, she gets a net cord. And, and there it is, Monica Sellis holding serve. And so Sellis playing well. Let's go out now to court number 13, where Natalie Tozio, France, going against Brenda Schultz of Holland. Court 13, Tozio with the first set, 6-4. And she is well in the lead here, 5 low. This is Brenda Schultz at the top of your picture. Natalie Tozio. Who has looked very sharp, Billy. It was very close in the first set, Barry. In fact, it looked like Brenda had her chances. But Tozia living up to her seating. There it is. <laughs> Natalie Tozia with a war dance. 6-4, six, 6 love. She moves into the second round. And so there it is. Tozia into the second round will go against Wood or Medveda. And so that's the story. And the ladies, let's head back now to court number one.
where Monica Sellis, the number one seed, is well in control, leading 5-2, already a set. Jenny Byrne at the top of your picture from Perth, Australia, Five base, trying to you. stay alive out here against the number one seed, Monica Sellis. Dr. Fee. Does she pick the ball early or what? Reminds me a lot of Jimmy Connors. Just stays low to the ground. Great concentration. We've mentioned that before, but she really gets into these matches. Just why? Byrne thought she had an ace. Second serve. Love 15. Fifteen all. Fifteen all. And there's Sal talking to herself, always pushing herself. Remember, she's on the Australian end of the French. Fifteen ten. As the Italian, she lost his seventeen in the finals. Let's just take a look at how much power. Look how low she gets. They threw the ball. Just amazing. So powerful. Two points away now. Salas would love to close this match out in this game. Not too happy with that return, Billy. You know what's interesting, though, Barry? She keeps going for it every single time, which is very good for people who play tennis. You have to keep going for it. You know, I think a lot of times we get real tentative if we make a couple of mistakes. Salas. <laughs> Courier, the best players in the world, they keep going for it. You mentioned another guy who goes for it, Jimmy Connor. Absolutely. Yes, just inside that sideline. Well, if you can get Sellis wide enough to open up that court so you have a play on it, it works. But look how close Burn has it. She hit the line, literally. Cheers. Again, the solid return catches Jenny Byrne just inside that service line. We're back to Deuce. Here's the dilemma when you're serving against Sellis. Do I serve her wide and hoping I place it well enough with enough power I can really have her on the stretch, or do I try to jam her and hit right at her? Just over. Oh, very close call on that baseline. Jenny Byrne hesitated for a moment, and Monica looked over at the base linesman. And so we have arrived at match point on court one. Game. Yes. Sellers, two sets to love. Six two. Sellers, a solid winner over here on court one. A straight set victory. This crowd giving both players a big hand. Monica Sellis is at Wimbledon this year, make no mistake about it, trying to win her third Grand Slam title. Let's have a look now at the draw for Monica Sellis. She will go against Sabine Appelmans in the second round. And so that's the story for Monica in round number two. And now let's go down where Monica is with our Andrea Yeager. Monica, you haven't played a grass court tournament in two mm -hmm. years. Were you comfortable out there today? That was a good first round match. You know, in the beginning, I had a little bit of a problem with my timing, and I was kind of excited, nervous, everything <laughs> all put together. But it was a good, comfortable first round. After the craziness of mm -hmm. your withdrawal from 91, are you having second thoughts about coming out here and talking about anything other than your tennis? Uh, not really. I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions from 1991. You know, there's nothing to hide. I was injured, and still, it's just the difficult part is when still people say, oh, it's a mystery illness, and all those things. It was shin splints, the stress factor, and I just hope that, you know, everybody will stop making all this mystique around the whole 1991 thing. Wimbledon presents a different kind of style of play. It's more of a mm -hmm. power game here. Are you going to have to make any adaptions to your game? Oh, definitely. I think I'm going to have to serve uh, much bigger than the French, and my returns will have to go a lot better than day one today in my passing shots, and a few things on my grass strokes. But I, I, you know, hopefully, as long as the matches keep progressing, I'll just you know have a little bit more match toughness and just get ready to, used to the surroundings. I mean, 
I haven't been on court one in two years, so it was a little different today. You don't, you don't get to practice on or anything, so it was fun. It was very exciting being on there. Are we going to see any changes with your hair this year? Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> now, what is this about the jewelry here? Let me see this ring that you oh, got okay. up there. <laughs> now, is that something that you're um, trying to make a little style statement? or? <laughs> uh, no, actually, this year in Rome, I went down to the new stand shop in the town. There was this young boy who was like 17, and I seen all these bucket full of these different color rings and I asked him uh, how much they are and he said oh you can't buy them you gotta buy sunscreen and I said oh please I want a few of them and then he was so nice and he gave them to me which is really sweet of him so <laughs> you're a millionaire tennis player and you have a ring that you got from buying sunscreen that's good uh, have you imagined holding the Wimbledon plate in your hand yet? Uh, not really I mean I never imagined any tournament um, but I, the Wimbledon was really the only tournament going up in the Slavia that I got to watch um, and I always seem to play and all the things around Deacon and but that's the only tournament I haven't won yet and I would definitely love to win it because it's the greatest one and, but I don't want to have the pressure on me that I got to do it because you know I just got to keep worrying about playing great right tennis and just looking to my next round. How tough is it for you not to think about the third leg of the Grand Slam? Oh not tough at all because even if I do very well here I still have the US Open which is really a tough tournament so uh, it's a long long way to go and I don't think this year will be the year for it. So. Good luck. Mm, Thank you. Thanks. HBO's coverage of the world's most prestigious tennis tournament continues. The championship at Wimbledon. And let's scan another handful of scores just to keep you posted on who's moving forward in the draw. Starting with American Patrick McEnroe, straight set winner over Francisco Montana of the United States. Patrick into the second round. Also Chris Wilkinson of England, the second English player to win today. He joins Mark Pecci in the second round with a four-set win over Pozzi of Italy. Arnie Toms of Germany knocked out American Todd Witzkin in four sets. Byron Black of Zimbabwe was a straight-set winner over Frederick Fontang of France. And on the women's side, Radkaz Rubakova, the Czechoslovakian veteran, a straight-set winner over Katja Oyeklaus of Germany. We told you earlier you'd get a chance to see Jimmy Connors in his 20th Wimbledon campaign. He is on court one right now against Luis Herrera of Mexico. We will take you there. And we arrive at all of the big serves, all of the volleys, all the ground strokes, and all the strawberries and cream you can possibly imagine from this first day of the 106th All England Lawn Tennis Championships. Our highlight program immediately following full match coverage at 7.30 Eastern and Pacific Time, and then again at 11.30 Eastern and Pacific Time this evening, and all through this first week of the championships. Right now, set four on court number one, Jimmy Connors and Luis Herrera. The foundation this year is fear. Fear about the marketability and spectator appeal of men's tennis on grass. In the wake of last year's Boris Becker, Michael Stich, Bullets at 60 Paces final, in which points averaged 2.6 seconds in duration, the International Tennis Federation is planning a meeting after this year's Wimbledon tournament to discuss ways and means of changing the game to make the points longer and more spectator interesting. Some of the rule changes that are under discussion requiring servers to keep one foot on the ground so that they can't leap into the air to hit at 125 miles per hour, shortening up the service line, raising the net, or the least likely change, cutting back service from two tries to one try. All of this has been prompted by the success of big, hard-serving players like Boris Becker, whose serves and bullet returns have gotten him into the final six of the last seven years and have won in three Wimbledon championships. For more on Becker and the changes in him, here's our Larry Merchant. If this is is mentioned with a chance, let's take our first look at him this year now as he takes on Omar Camparese, a clay court specialist with some skill, out on center court. Becker has won each of the three previous matches between the two players. And as we pick it up, it is 15-40, 5-5 in the third set. Double break point, Camparese service. Stand back up. And Pacific time, highlights at 7.30 and again at 11.30 p.m. That's during week one of the 106th Lawn Tennis Championship. As we leave you, we remind you of three big stories from today. Defending champion Michael Stich moves on. So does Jim Curry of the French Open champ. Jimmy Connors at 39 is gone. of the 106th 
106 Long Tennis Championships at Wimbledon, and the clock runs on Grand Slam bids for both genders. The towering ambitions of Jim Courier debut. Can he adapt his game to a seemingly unfriendly surface? The same question applies to Monica Seller. One year after she mysteriously dissed the tournament, something Jimmy Connors would never have done. At 39, for the 20th time, he is he. Sometimes indifferent, but generally fair day, upwards of 30,000 fans made their way onto the lawns of the Lawn Tennis Club at Wimbledon for the 106th renewal of the world's most prestigious, most meaningful, most frightening tennis tournament. And welcome back again. I'm Jim Lampley with Arthur Ashe. And Arthur, leaving aside the inexperienced players who are probably excited by everything that happens here, what do champions veterans want to feel like on this first day that it's just another tennis tournament or that it's the most important day of the year well i can give you four different answers if you're jimmy connors you want one more day in the sun if you're boris becker and you've won it three times eh, yes but i'm not that excited if you're pete Samper, i know i can win this tournament everybody tells me i can if you're andre agassi then you're a little afraid. You've got the monk in your back. I haven't won a Grand Slam yet, and I probably won't do it here. So 128 players in the draw, probably 128 different feelings on day one. But we're going to show you the experience now of four champions who are playing today. Between them, they've won Wimbledon eight times on the men's side. And all of them were in action on the show court. Play is an anachronism in the new age of big power, rocket-serving, bullet-returning tennis that has many in the sport worried about the entertainment value of the men's game on grass. The International Tennis Federation will meet after Wimbledon to examine possible rules changes aimed at slowing down the points and making them more watchable. Case in point, the straight set victory today for Shuzo Matsuoka of Japan over Mal Washington of the United States in a match that had no four or five stroke rally. Also, Wayne Ferreira moved forward today with a four set win over John Fitzgerald of Australia. Ferreira is a fast rising young South African and Brad Gilbert of the United States got a straight set win over Jean-Philippe Florian of France. Arthur Ashe and I will be back a little bit later to talk about those possible rules changes and the entertainment value of the men's game. Now for more on differing styles of play at Wimbledon, let's go to Barry McKay and Billie Jean Pin. All right, Jim. Well, there are four players in this tournament who are allegedly allergic to grass. Courier, Lendl, Arantxa Sanchez Vicario, and Monica Seles. Billie Jean, I'll tell you something, these four did not look too allergic to grass today, but how do you think the courts played? I think the bounces were very true. I thought they looked similar to cement courts. No question about it. It was a very true day on these fine grass courts. And Billy, I know you've worked with some great champions over the past few years, and you've got a line for players that, you know, have trouble adjusting or, or working into new conditions. This is true. Whether I've helped a recreational player or the number one player in the world, I always say champions adjust. Champions adjust, and four champions adjusted very well today to these grass courts. Let's have a look now at the highlights of those four players. A bright sun greeted the number one seed, Jim Courier, as he walked out onto court number one to try for a win at Wimbledon this year. Finally, we missed her last year. First set action, sell us up 2-1. And her return of serve was spectacular all day long. It's absolutely her strength as a return of serve. All the, off either side, forehand Game. or her backhand. And so Stellis, continuing to hit the return, went on to win the first set, 6-2. Now Stellis up 3-1 in the second. Just too much. Another clean winner off the backhand. Zellis now leading 4-1 and moving out ahead. The Australian knows how to play net, Billy. Not good enough there. And now Monica Sellis at match point. 
a tremendous two-hander, and there it was, an easy 6-2, 6-2 win. We asked her about missing Wimbledon last year. There's nothing to hide. I was injured, and still, it's just the difficult part is when still people say, oh, it's a mystery illness, and all those things. It was shin splints, the stress factor, and I just hope that, you know, everybody will stop making all this mystique around the whole 1991. And now, a Rocha Sanchez Vicario, the number five seed, rode on to court number two to face Leila Meshki. This was a Rocha Sanchez concentrating well. First set action, one all. For strength, love sending the backhand down the line. And Sanchez went on to win that first set, 6-3. Now it was second set. Sanchez Vicario having a bit more trouble, up 6-5. And right here, Meshki Billy on the full run. Hanging in there, the keeper of the tiebreak. Excellent cross court forehand. A smile from Leila Meshki. Now Sanchez Vicario showed why she has great imagination in her game. One of the best points of the match. And Sanchez Vicario moved to match point in the tie break. And there it was, game set and match for Arancha Sanchez Vicario, who won it in straight set, 6-3 and 7-6. I'll look at the analysis here, Billy. The big difference, winners and net points won as well. Later this summer, Arancha Sanchez Vicario will try to win a gold medal for Spain at home in Barcelona in front of King Juan Carlos. What a thrill that'll be for her. For most players in the sport, the most thrilling moment is the first time they play on center court here at Wimbledon. For more on that patch of ground, here is Chris Collinsworth at your service. The atmosphere of uh, the tennis at Walking Road would be lost, and I was very concerned about it. And of course, you can imagine the new stadium, uh, it didn't have all the lovely Virginia creeper that climbed around the walls. Now, so it did look rather bad. But uh, it was a great success the first championship here. Frenchman Jean Baratra dazzled fans on the new center court, winning championships in 24 and 26. But even more dazzling was the first televised matches of Wimbledon in 1937. Then in 1940, Wimbledon suffered its darkest moment when German bombs hit center court. The bomb went through the roof, exploded within the court, and uh, blew up part of the roof. Uh, we all knew it had been hit, uh, amongst many other buildings. It wasn't revealed, actually, for some time afterwards, for a security reason. It was too easily identified. Play resumed in 46. Jack Kramer was the first champion to wear shorts in 47. The scoreboard was redesigned in 68, and Cyclops made its controversial debut in 1980. Then in 1990, because of several soccer disasters, new safety laws led to the removal of the standing room section at center court, a move that incensed many and made center court tickets almost impossible to come by for the average fan, that is, unless you were willing to deal with the scalpers. If you can send a court ticket from a five seat in the house, if you send a court ticket from a five seat in the house, if you send a court ticket from a five seat in the house. There's someone who does a little negotiating with those guys. Believe me, there have been plenty of bad seats on center court. I remember last year I bought a ticket from one of those guys and ended up with a seat right behind a pole. But the latest renovations at center court have virtually eliminated that problem. This past year, what we have done is we took the old center court roof away. We then removed the 26 pillows and replaced those 26 pillows with just four pillows. So instead of having about 25% of our seats having a semi-obscure view of the play, we've just got 1%. This is my third year here at Wimbledon, and usually this first week we're all working so hard that none of us get a chance to watch any tennis, but this year it's going to be different. After a little negotiating, here I am at center court. Great seats, huh, guys? Yes, sir. Oh, no! Hey, I don't know why Chris is upset. I sold him that ticket for half price. But seriously, Arthur, there are complaints about the entertainment value of men's tennis on grass. And as we mentioned during the telecast, a possible move by the International Tennis Federation to change the rules, slow down the points, make it more interesting. What's going to happen? I'm not sure, but I, first of all, am firmly convinced, and I agree with the fact that they have to do something. Certainly the entertainment value last year I thought was noticeably poor. I don't see too much difference right now after day one. 
two remedies have been suggested very strongly. One is that the men go back to the pre-1959 rules, keep one foot on the ground while serving, and the other suggestion possibly is to change the balls, meaning you'll have softer, lower pressure balls for men singles and faster balls for women singles. But some people think if you do that, the racket manufacturers will only feel challenged, they'll come up with stronger rackets. But I certainly think the first line of defense here is to change the balls. Will they change the balls? They can do that technically very easy. It's not a difficult thing to do. I think they'll fiddle around with it. They have to do something. Let's take a look at some of the reasons why. Some of the players whose overpowering games have raised these questions. With Bob, if you've been paying attention, you've probably figured out that it comes from Jimmy Connors' battle against Luis Herrera of Mexico. The match signaled Connors' farewell from the tournament today, but this point gave all of his fans and those fans of Herrera, something to remember. That's the kind of tennis the International Tennis Federation hopes to see more of in the future. How they'll get it remains to be seen. We want to remind you that Wednesday evening we'll be debuting our delayed coverage of the heavyweight championship boxing match between champion Evander Holyfield and challenger Larry Holmes. The bout is 5 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific time, followed by highlights at 7.30, and then the half-hour highlight show is repeated at 11.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific time. And tomorrow's Ladies' Day here at Wimbledon. Top-seeded Monica Seles has already gotten her first match under her belt. But tomorrow, nine-time champion Martina Navratilova, three-time champion Steffi Groff, Gabriela Sabatini, Jennifer Capriotti, all the other top women will be in action for the first time, and we'll have coverage of all that for you tomorrow evening. Thanks very much for being with us. We leave you now with scores from some of today's other significant matches. And the spotlight falls on the women of Wimbledon. Elegant married the muscle, a perfect adornment for these sacred lawns. For over 100 years, they have graced the lawn tennis club ground in a summer ritual that transcends time. A ritual where presence meets past, where former greats live forever in the footfalls of their descendants. Look, there's Suzanne Lundlock, a six-time champion who never lost a single match at Wimbledon. What do you know? Ellen Will Foodie. For six decades, no woman surpassed her record eight titles. And there's Little Mo. A month after winning her third consecutive championship, she broke her leg and never played again. What a pity. Could that be Billie Jean King? It seems like yesterday she won the first of her 20 Wimbledon titles. From Gibson to Everett. And Gulagong to Austin. The charm splendor of these tennis greats, as vivid today as in the mists of yesteryear. Yes, the women of Wimbledon hold a special place in every tennis fan's heart, so precious that since 1884, only 41 women have captured the silver plate. One thing is certain, the first Tuesday tradition of Wimbledon continues. Welcome, ladies. This is your day. Two breaks over an all-England lawn tennis club made giddily happy by one small gift from God. After a first day of sunshine, more matches have been played in the 106th lawn tennis championships than were completed in the first three days of last year's tournament. One more day of sunshine, and the tournament is virtually assured of a regular schedule. So today, more than 30,000 will file through the turnstiles to see most of the prominent women on court for the first time. And the official weather report from the Metropolitan Office of the London Weather Center 
Variable, although mostly rather large amounts of cloud are likely this afternoon and evening, though it will be generally bright and there should be a little sunshine. Like yesterday, Wimbledon will most probably be dry. So with the major news of the day now digested, we welcome you back to our announced conservatory. I'm Jim Lampley, joined today by six-time women's singles champion Billie Jean King. And Billie Jean, let's start by talking about the one prominent woman who has already completed a first-round match. Number one seeded Monica Seles had to occupy that position because of her enormous success in the past year, but a lot of people say she's not a grass court player. I disagree. I think she's a great grass court player, and I think she's going to get better the more she plays on it. The reason? Her ground strokes are formidable on both sides. She has two hand on both sides. She's actually left-handed. Sometimes you forget. Also, she has the best return of serve in women's tennis. But she's not a serve and volley player. Is she your favorite to win the tournament? No, she's not. Steffi Graf's my favorite. And Steffi Graf won the tournament for the third time last year. Maybe she'll get a showdown with Celis at the end of this tournament. It would be fascinating to watch. Let's take a look at the seeded women, and you show us where the favorites are located in the draw. Well, Celis is number one, I think, because emotionally and mentally she's really the strongest. Also, she's won two legs on the Grand Slam this year, the Australian and the French. Groff, three-time Wimbledon champion, also the defending champion this year. Terrific serve, powerful, high-risk forehand. Uh, you just never know what's going to happen on that side. Great athlete. Sabatini has it all. She plays all-court tennis. She's got slices, top spins. The one weakness, her serve. And then Martina Navratilova, winning nine times here, never can count her out, Jim. I think she needs a little more self-confidence. She really hasn't played very many matches this year. All right. We remind you that Monica Seles, the top seed, has already played her first-round match. She rolled to a straight-set victory yesterday. But Billie Jean and I will have a lot to watch over today. Starting on court number two, where the now 16-year-old American phenomenon, Jennifer Capriati, plays another 16-year-old, virtually unknown Shonda Rubin, they have never met before. And we'll move over to court number one, where John McEnroe, dropping hints left and right that this might be his last Wimbledon campaign, is matched against a tough Brazilian player, Luis Matar, in the first round they've played twice, and McEnroe has won both times. Following that on court number one, last year's women's runner-up, Gabriela Sabatini, takes on Christelle Foch. It will be the first meeting for those two players. And then on court number one, Andre Agassi of the United States, after having won a lot of friends and fans in his visit here last year, opens the tournament against a tough player, Andrei Chesnikov, formerly of the Soviet Union, now listed from Russia. On center court today, nine-time women's champion Martina Navratilova against the youngest of the three Maleva sisters. They played once, and Martina won that match. And then Steffi Graf, the defending champion and three-time titleist, seated second, takes on Noel Van Lottem, of France. She has a Dutch name, but she plays for France. They have never met before. Let's talk a little bit more about Graf. Now 23 years old, we assume at the peak of her maturity and ready to make her imprint on the sport in the next few years if she hasn't done so already. Well, she's won 64 tournaments. Her big year was 88, Jim, when she won the Grand Slam plus the Olympic gold. And last year, uh, the 90 finalist, Zena Garrison, she beat her easily. Mary Jo Fernandez took her out. And the best match I've ever seen here at Wimbledon against Gabriela Sabatini. Graf won her third title by winning 8-6 in the third. The late rounds of the women's competition are tougher now than they were a decade ago, but in the early rounds there are still some mismatches, and this might be one of them. 19-year-old Noel Van Lottem, as we say, she plays for France, though she has a Dutch father and was born in France, and uh, the experience gap is enormous here. Very inexperienced. She finally won the Wellington tournament, but she beat Donna Faber, who is not a really high-ranking player. All right, well, let's take our first look of the tournament now at one of the favorites in the women's competition, three-time titleist Steffi Graf against Noel Van Lottem on center court. Graf needs four games to love. Steffi Graf, second-ranked in the world behind Monica Seles. Van Lottem's ranking is a nice, round, even 100. Thank 
Now, Ben Lottom thought that was going to go out. I was too close to be so relaxed about it. And it's unusual uh, for Steffi Graf to charge the net off of return of serve. Can you imagine how Van, Van Lottem feels today playing against the defending champion, center court, terrific experience for the number 100 player. So Steffi Graf continues to cruise in the second set against Noel Van Lottem on center court. And still to come, a look at a young American woman for whom things have not been going so swimmingly recently. Now 16-year-old Jennifer Capriotti in her third visit to Wimbledon, quarterfinalist two years ago before she lost to Graf, semifinalist last year beaten by Sabatini, and back to try to make her mark again. And we go back to center court, where Steffi Graf is one game away from completing her first round match against Noel Van Lottem. And we'll take a look at an overall analysis of what's happened in this match so far. Billie Jean? The biggest difference really is right there this, on the second line where it says winners. 22 for Graf, only 6 for Van Lottem. Otherwise, it's not, big, not that big a difference. And, of course, you can surmise that the vast majority of those 22 winners come from the forehand shot. Yes, which is her high-risk shot, but it's also her weapon. Groff is definitely making an effort to go to net more often when she's serving as well as when she's returning. And you know, uh, Heinz Gunhart, her coach, is trying to get her to go to net more often to really complete her game. Steffi Graf is amazingly consistent in leaving no margin for error against lesser challengers in early rounds of tournaments. She 
he hasn't lost before the quarterfinals of a tour event in seven years. It's amazing. Isn't that incredible? It really is. I mean, you've just got to figure somewhere along the way you get a tough draw, or you're not feeling well, or you have an ankle sprain or something. Doesn't happen to Grunt. At least not before the quarterfinals. Easily done. 6-1, six, 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 six love for Steffi Graf. Noelle Van Laten has her moment in the sun on center court and takes a spanking for it. And now Steffi Graf will move forward into the second round where she'll play the winner of the match between Javer and Wardell. She'll be heavily favored to progress on toward the later rounds of the tournament. Back of his hand, but most attention fell to Martina and Jennifer and the other leading lights of their gender. Day two, the traditional ladies' day at Wimbledon. Another happy day of forgiving weather in the skies above the All England Lawn Tennis Club. And for once, the tournament is right on schedule, one year after last year's rain-drenched first week disaster. A crowd of more than 30,000 filed through the turnstiles to observe the traditional Ladies' Day. Good evening, welcome back to the All England Club. And Billie Jean, I've got a bee in my bonnet, okay? <laughs> Every year we come here and we read and, and hear that you must be a serving volley player to win on the grass courts of Wimbledon. Goodbye, Sellis and Courier. They can't win, right? That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Sellis and Courier can win. We've had great baseline players from the past who have won. Borg, Connors, Conley, Everett, just to name a few. Do I have to keep going? What about this? Michael Chang, though? He loses because of his style of play, right? Today, he had too many unforced errors, but he's also more of a retriever than the others. They punish the ball when they hit off the ground. Puts the others on the defense right away. They can hit clean winners from the baseline. So don't rule out the baseline players like Courier and Sellis as long as they play aggressively. That's exactly right. All right, well, let's take a look at some baseline players who are dreaming of winning Wimbledon this year as we go to today's highlights. On center court, three-time women's champion, defending titleist Steffi Graf, looking for a fourth Wimbledon title, seeded number two. Her opponent today, Noelle Van Lottem of France. And Graf showing us her high-risk forehand. She's her big weapon. Most destructive single weapon in women's tennis. It took Graf to a 5-1 lead in the first set. And Graf using this match to try to venture more and more up to net. This is what she's been working on to try to adjust to the fast courts here at Wimbledon. Graf took the first set 6-1 and tried to move forward toward a typical early round Wimbledon blowout. But Van Lottem's a spunky player who wasn't ready to give up. Still, Steffi was preeminent. Three love in the second set. Again, Groff showing us she can play net. Afterwards, Steffi spoke to Andrea Yeager about her attitude. <laughs> I think uh, lately I've been playing better, so I feel a lot better off the court, too. And uh, I've been taking a lot of time away from tennis. I mean, I practice real hard, but then I take the chance to, to do some things in the evening, and uh, I've been enjoying that. 
American Mary Jo Fernandez, semifinal loser to Groff last year, another baseliner at heart who wants to play a more aggressive serve and volley game here. Her opponent was Bentley. She led one love in the first set as we pick it up. Mary Jo, known for her ground strokes, Jim. Love with that running cross-court forehand. At four love, Fernandez in the first set, a little touch of the serve and volley. Mary Jo always practices this in the early rounds, but going forward, oh, gee, but can she do it later? Fernandez took the first set and got the three love in the second set. More of the serve and volley experimentation. That's what she needs because Mary Jo doesn't really have a weapon. And that 6-1-5 love match point for Fernandez against Sarah Bentley. An easy victory for Miami's Mary Jo Fernandez. Since the semifinal a year ago and would like to do better this time. Seventh seeded Michael Chang. The seeding reflects his world ranking, but not his ability to play on grass. Today, he took the court against an Englishman with a lot of crowd support. England's number one, Jeremy Bates. Michael Chang not being able to do anything because he always tries to top spin the ball sits up. And also, not a big enough serve. And the nature of Chang's game gives Bates a lot of opportunities to come to net even when receiving serve. But there, the quick Chang was able to make the get and win the point. 4-4 in the first set. Chang having trouble all day. Yeah. Making unforced errors. Maybe just not comfortable enough on grass. Chang lost in the first round to Tim Mayotte a year ago. Bates took the first set here, 6-4, and went up 4-3 in the second. And Bates kept applying the pressure. The volley error for Chang cost him the second set, so Bates was up two sets to love. 3-1, Bates in the third. Good serve and volley, Jim. Kept going forward. He knew that was his only chance to beat Chang. Bates squandered a couple of match points before finally getting an opportunity to put it away. And for the second year in a row, Michael Chang packed his bags early to leave Wimbledon. And English fans who had made their way to court 14 from all over the grounds took advantage of the rare opportunity to celebrate. A Billie Jean, a statistical profile. Bates forced the issue, went to net all the time, and forced Chang into too many unforced errors. Gabriella Sabatini, finalist a year ago, hoping to do better this time and win the championship for the first time. First meeting ever with Christine Foch. Gabriella has it all. Death at net. She uses the court wisely. I think she has more variety in her game, Billie Jean, than any other player, male or female. Without any doubt, you're right. And her mobility has improved over the last couple of years. After a 6-1 first set, Sabatini made it to 5-1 in the second set. She's been working on her serve with Carlos Permar. Is it better? Game's in. It looks a little bit better. It took the racket out of Foch's hands there. So Gabriela Sabatini, like Steffi Groff, got an easy first round win. Gabriela Sabatini's quest to go back to the women's final takes her next to a meeting with Isabel Demongeau. She'll be heavily favored to go on forward into the draw. Some more scores from around the grounds. First, the left bank lefty Guy Forget was a four set winner over Alexander Morantz. He's the ninth seed in the tournament and he moves forward. Yana Novotna, 11th seed among the women, straight set winner over Dominique Manami. Zena Garrison of the United States got a straight set easy win over Federica Bonsignori. Conchita Martinez, a straight set winner over Mary Lou Daniels. Richard Krychek is mentioned by many as a dark horse to win the tournament. The big serving Dutchman moved on in straight sets. 
and Andre Agassi's match with Andre Chesnikov was suspended because of darkness and rain with Agassi even at a set apiece and trailing 2-1 in the third. For more on what happened on this second day of Wimbledon 1992, we turn you over now to Barry McKay and Arthur Ashe. All right, thanks, Jim. Well, it's been a day for the crafty lefties out here at Wimbledon. Martina looking very sharp on the center court. John McEnroe on court number one, showing some of that mid-80 form with that touch left-handed drop volley. And even on court two, the flamboyant Frenchman, Henri Leconte, looking very, very good. And Arthur, what is so tough about lefties? They drive us all crazy. Well, they certainly drive me crazy. Guys like Rod Laver, basically because the ball is coming the wrong way. It spins, caroms, ricochets, bounces off the grass, and it goes in the opposite direction. And it's just, as you say, it's nerve-wracking. Speaking of Rod Laver, you've played him a few times. What was so tough about that lefty? Well, he had a very wicked serve. He was very quick. And I think it was his running forehand down the line that you didn't know which way it was going to go. So you lead one way, and the ball went the other way. And that's exactly what's happened to the right-handers today playing the lefties, these crafty left-handers. The left-handers, we saw some beautiful shots from them today, and now we're going to have a look at some of the highlights from left-handers. The crafty lefties were at work at Wimbledon on day number two. Henri Leconte taking on Roberto Azar. First set, Leconte leading 2-1. And you're looking at one of the game's great shot makers, and there's the reason why. Lightning quick reflexes. Henri Leconte now up 4-3 in the first set. And talk about touch, Arthur. Watch this drop volley. Very nice half volley for a winner. On the soft green grass, court number two. Leconte went on to win that first set, 6-3. Now it was 5-love, Leconte on a roll. Oh! And he literally and was on a roll. And a little bit of luck, as he indicates, putting his racket up in the air and kissing the strings. And at 6-love, Leconte now was up two sets to love. Third set, Leconte, 5-3. Waits for the call. Oh, yes. This guy can use a crowd better than anybody, Arthur. Yes, BDI, uh, look at the far sidelines woman. She isn't backing down at all. Match point. The flamboyant Frenchman was about ready to win this match in straight sets. A big left-handed no, serve, no. and he talks the ball out, and Henri Leconte, a winner. Three sets to love, six, six three, six, six love, six, six three. three. The number four seed, Martina Navratilova, on center court against Magdalena Maliva. A big hand for the nine-time Wimbledon singles champion. Magdalena is the youngest of the three Maleva sisters. Maleva from the far court. Very green, slippery center court. Martina looking sharp. Went on to win that first set, 6-2. Would dearly love to win her 10th Wimbledon singles title. Second set, now Martina in command, leading 3-1. Point. Well, that's one way, Barry, of trying to get the ball back over the net. Second set now. Martina still leading 3-2. Always thought her overhead was one of her strong points, Arthur. Yes, and if any woman here in the draw knows this center court as well as Martina, I don't know who that person is. She won it in straight sets. We had a chance to talk to her after the match. I would have liked to have had uh, a few more matches, but at the same time, I've played so many in my career. I should be able to pull some of those resources and uh, and remember. You know, if I can't remember what to do at three, I'll break point in the third set. I'm in trouble. So I think I'll be okay, and the match play really won't come into effect. And then next door to court number one, where the three-time Wimbledon champion and John McEnroe is taking on Brazilian Luis Matar. McEnroe and Matar get a big hand as they walk out to court number one. McEnroe now with flecks of gray in his hair. First set, four all. McEnroe shows what a great servant volleyer he is. 
More than any other player except Stefan Edberg, McEnroe has the ability to put the first volley away as he get on that first point. McEnroe leading first set 5-4. Oh, and a half volley flick of a forehand for a winner down the line. But Matar literally stone footed, didn't move. McEnroe, though, in trouble here. Matar showing some good touch in the first set. And Luis Matar went on to win that first set 7-5. Now second set, McEnroe up 2-1. Put that in mid-court on the fly, flip the cross court for a winner. McEnroe on a roll, up 5-1, second set. Again, coming into the full court to knock off the volley. And he went on to win that second set, 6-1. Now McEnroe was starting to come on, third set, 2-1 for McEnroe. He knows how to cover net, doesn't he, Arthur? Yes, he does. He anticipated that one, and he guessed right. Third set, McEnroe up 5-3. A little extra effort by McEnroe at net. Again, up into the full court. And again, a volley for a winner. So McEnroe won that third set, 6-3. McEnroe up now, two sets to one. Fourth set, McEnroe leading 3-2. You're talking about rolling. Now he is in full cry, as the British say. And John McEnroe had arrived at match point, court one. And it went long, and a ball to the stands as the three-time Wimbledon champion went on to win it in four sets. A look at this graphic, Arthur, tells a big story. It certainly does. McEnroe serving very well. Look at those winners, 66. In past years, it wouldn't have quickened the pulse for us to see John McEnroe beat a player like Luis Matar, but we've gotten so used to seeing him lose in big tournaments that it comes almost as a pleasant surprise to see him win. He's made peace with Wimbledon and the All England Club, but the relationship is still fraught with intrigue, as he told our Chris Collinsworth yesterday. Me, but... The things he's talking about point up the fact that for people like Capriati and Agassi, this is a tough fishbowl in which to grow up, isn't it? It is. It's a real small world, but it's so intense. And there's photographers, people are invading their privacy all the time. They feel like they don't have any breathing room, any time just to grow up and be a teenager, for instance, for Jennifer Capriati. It's very difficult because it's relentless, all the pressure they're getting. John McEnroe, he has some perspective now. Ten years ago, he would have said, the All England Club, it's the pits of the world. I hate it. I'm never going back there. And now he's starting to think about enjoying some of the various activities around the club. Let's hope that people like Capriati and Agassi and some of the other young players can learn to enjoy themselves before it's too late. Well, we'll take a look at how the young and the reckless did today and which ones enjoyed this Wimbledon experience. A couple of American 16-year-olds with a lot in common, right? Not exactly. Jennifer Capriati is a household name. Her opponent, Chanda Rubin, is a virtual unknown. And in the first set, they played that way as Capriati steamrolled Rubin six love. Rubin just had many unforced errors, but they play similar styles. They're basically baseline players. 1-1 in the second set, and Rubin began to get a bearing. But Rubin only got going. She had nothing to lose. With shots like that, Ruben came from down 5-1, eventually to level the set at five apiece. I don't understand why Ruben didn't run after this, Jim. There were stages of the match in which he just wasn't aggressive, but then the same was true of Capriati. You. Inexperienced. Plenty of potential on both sides of the net. 6-5, Capriati got tough to close out the match. Okay, so Fort Lauderdale, Florida, cruises right on past Lafayette, Louisiana. And Jennifer Capriati moved on. 16th seeded David Wheaton, a semifinalist against Boris Becker a year ago, took on Francisco Clavet of Spain in the first round. First set, 3-2 Wheaton, and the serve and volley style was evident. Wheaton went on to take the first set, 6-3. Wheaton ending up 
where it likes to be at the net. And he took the second set by the same score, 6-3. Wheaton, forward, forward, forward. A lot of us thought after his experience here last year, Billy Jean, that David Wheaton would go right on into the top ten. It hasn't happened. Okay. But he did win this match in straight sets and moved on into the second round. He was the champion in 1987. Today, Pat Cash, coming back to the spirited Yako Elting, threw his headband to the crowd and got ready to move on into the second round for a We Were the Champions matchup with John McEnroe. The victory over Elting was Pat Cash's 29th career match here at Wimbledon, leading us to believe that scattered around the UK somewhere are 29 of those wretched checkerboard headbands. May they live forever. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the point of the day. It comes from the McEnroe-Matar match. And we're going to show you John McEnroe with a terrific get of a short lob by Matar, followed by a backhand winner down the line. One of several of McEnroe's points in the last two sets of that match that excited the crowd on court number one. We remind you that tomorrow evening you'll get a double dose of championship sports here on HBO at 9 o'clock Eastern and Pacific time, one hour after tennis. Our delayed broadcast of Friday night's World Heavyweight Championship fight between Holyfield and Holmes. Fight goes 12. Holyfield wins unanimous decision. Holmes blows lunch in the corner at the end of the fight. It's all here and all yours on HBO. And we remind you to stay tuned with us for more of Wimbledon. Tomorrow through Friday at 5 o'clock through 7.30 Eastern and Pacific time. Full match coverage. Followed by highlight shows at 7.30 and then again at 11.30 p.m. Tomorrow we'll be back at 5 o'clock Eastern and Pacific time with full match coverage. You'll see the resumption of Andre Agassi's match with Andre Chesnikov. Call it your dinner with two Andres. Agassi at one set apiece with Chesnikov and leading to one in the third. You'll also see second round matches for two women who are threatening to win the championship here. Martina Navratilova, who's won it nine times, and Monica Seles, who's looking for her first Wimbledon crown. So now for Arthur and Billie Jean and Barry McKay, and all the rest of our Wimbledon coverage crew, I'm Jim Lampley saying good night. We'll give you more scores as we go away. The executive producer of eight calling the long tennis championship long walk off a short pier time for mere pretenders to the loftiest throne in tennis after two days of relatively benign weather most of the world's top players find themselves in the unusual position of having completed first round matches and not unanimously to their satisfaction witness for instance the unceremonious departures of two american commercial tennis commodities first jimmy connors and then Michael Chang. Both of them nuked by lesser-known opponents. In Chang's case, stop the tournament. An Englishman has won. Jeremy Bates' three-set triumph set off paroxysms of ecstasy on and around court 14. God save our queen. Elsewhere, the Yanks were still coming. McEnroe, for instance, who served himself to a win. Courier takes a second day off today. A relief to rivals who barely remember his last loss. And Agassi tries to finish off Chesnikov for undisputed Andre supremacy today. And Edberg's elegance continues apace. And still Monica Sellis is here in the race. Day three, your worship, your ladyship, your grace. Tennis. And an All England Lawn Tennis Club, once unnerved by the concept, now embraces it with spectacular enthusiasm. Total prize money for this year's championships, £4,400,000. Present conversion rate, just about $2 to the pound. Added up, it's almost £9,000,000. £265,000 to the gentleman's singles winner, £240,000 to the ladies' singles winner. Even the mixed doubles champions get the split. 100,000 American clams, and they do so under typically opaque English skies. Temperature 72 degrees, the wind is light, 
and in the curious English euphemism, the skies are partly sunny, not partly cloudy. And hello again, welcome back. I'm Jim Lampley with 1975 men's singles champion Arthur Ashe. And Arthur, because Jim Courier is number one and halfway to a Grand Slam, one schedule oddity sticks out to me like a sore thumb. Courier takes a second day in a row off today because they want him to play a match during the showcase weekend. And last year, Boris Becker, inconvenienced by the rain, complained of having to play too many matches all at once at the end of the tournament and said he was tired. Did the same thing happen to Courier? Well, it could, but that was the second week that Becker was talking about. You have to keep in mind that Wimbledon, unlike the other three Grand Slams, has played over 13 days, not 14. And if you're going to win all the way through, you've got to play seven days. Seven of 13, that's not a bad schedule. You've got to also figure that it's going to rain here, for sure. So I don't think Curry would complain one way or the other. If we told him he had to play five matches tomorrow, so be it. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the men's seeds, and you tell me a story or two, Arthur. Well, certainly of the six American seeds, Michael Chang at number seven in the top quarter of the draw was out to Jeremy Bates, but the guy I really want to talk about is down in the bottom quarter, Yvonne Lindell, soon to be a naturalized American. He is struggling, but he gives himself, like John McEnroe, a bit of a chance to win this tournament. Such a head change for Lindell to be seeded 10, not ranked in the top 10, incentive for him or discouraging to someone who worked so hard to get to where he was well so many of us in the journalistic profession like myself at times put Lendl there in those places where he would gladly trade one of his french open titles for a wimbledon title but he realizes this is not his best service he's got to struggle but he still gives himself a pretty good chance so maybe with a more realistic perspective he is as dangerous now as he was when he was a truly great player two or three years ago well certainly the, the pressure is not on him to win nobody expects him to win i don't really think he thinks he's going to win but he's going to give it a good shot in fact if you want a 50 to 1 bet here in the tournament fly to england and put your money down on lindell right now we'll be seeing him today on court number 14 against german player Arne Toms, Yvonne Lendl, meeting Arne Toms on court 14, the one time they played before, Toms won. Over on court number two today, the defending champion, German Michael Stich, takes on Famas Amos Mansdorf of Israel. Mansdorf has had some good moments here, and he has beaten Stich, the only previous time they met head-to-head. -head. On center court today, the Madonna of women's tennis, Monica Sellis, as, as her opponent, Appelmans, Sabina Appelmans, and head-to-head, -head, Sellis has won their only previous meeting. Pete Sampras follows Monica Sellis on to center court. The young American, given by many a good chance to win the tournament, he leads Todd Woodbridge in their series 2-1. to one. Woodbridge, a good grass court player from Australia. Now, here's maybe the greatest grass court player of his generation, two-time Wimbledon champion Stefan Edberg, taking on Gary Muller, who's also a grass court player, and Edberg has lost to Muller in their one previous meeting. Martina Navratilova will be playing UCLA's Kimberly Poe on court number one. They have never met before. And Andre Agassi will try to complete his match with Andre Chesnikov because yesterday your dinner with two Andres was interrupted by rain and darkness with the two players having split the first two sets and Chesnikov leading 2-1 in the third. Arthur, does the suspension and resumption affect the match in any way? I don't think so, only in one respect. The, the court today is going to be drier, it's going to be faster, and I think that's going to help Chesnikov because he's so much taller, he'll be, be able to get about the court a lot better. Otherwise, no, I don't see any difference at all. All right, Arthur, give us a biographical look at the two Andres as we get ready to watch them. Well, Agassi is a youngish 22, just under six feet. His ATP ranking has dropped out of the top 10 to 14. He's won 15 tournaments, lives in Las Vegas. This year, he has won the tournament in Atlanta. And he reached the semifinals of the French Open two weeks ago against Jim Courier. Did not play very well in the second and third sets of that semifinal loss. And let's look at Chesnikov, best known as a clay court player. Yes, he won Monte Carlo last year. He's 26. He's 6'2". He's ranked 31. A slim 167. He's won seven tournaments. Lived in Moscow. First time he's been here since 1989. Never won a Wimbledon match here. And never passed the semifinal of any Grand Slam event. And because uh, he hasn't done well at Wimbledon, even though Chesnikov at one time ranked as high as ninth, it would be an upset for him to beat Agassi today. Yes, no question. Agassi is definitely favored. All right, let's take a look at an overall analysis of what has happened in the match up to the point at which it was resumed. Well, we were both a little disappointed the way Agassi played the first set. He lost that set, even though he was serving generally fairly well, getting 66% of his first serves in. Winners. This category is where I am surprised because you expect Agassi to hit more winners than Chesnikov, but that is not the case. Unforced errors also for Agassi, not where it should be. 
All right, so will it be Agassiz's aggression or Chesnikov's relatively passive resistance? Let's check in for another look, right? Two, Michael Stich, the Wimbledon defending champion, going against Amos Monsdorf from Israel. Monsdorf beat him at Philadelphia earlier this year. Billy, what about Michael Stich, the defending champion? He comes in here, a lot of confidence? Tremendous amount of confidence. He knows what it feels like to be out there on center court, hold on to that trophy, finish, shake hands.